we have four New Year's. Number one, the month of Passover, Nisan, begins the new year for determining the reign of kings, as well as the actual biblical first month. God decreed that Nisan is the first month of the biblical religious calendar. As Jewish celebrants recall the Exodus and our freedom from Egypt, we acknowledge the true beginning of the epoch of Judaism that brought freedom to the Jewish people. It also marked the change of God's relationship with us. Initially, our holy covenant was only between God and Abraham. Then it was communicated to Abraham's son. Then Abraham's grandchildren and great-grandchildren were brought into the covenant. Finally, this tremendous connection was expanded to become a covenant between the God of Israel and all the people of Israel who had been led out of slavery. The nation of Israel was really born at Passover. Think of it like Jewish Independence Day, the 4th of July, and a Happy New Year all rolled into one super spiritual celebration. Number two, Elul is the new year for tithing animals. The Talmud presumed that most animals were born during the month of Av. The rabbis decided that the required tithe of sheep and cattle detailed in Leviticus chapter 27 would therefore be ready for sacrifice by Elul. Number three, Shavat is the new year for trees with the celebration of the Jewish holiday of Tu Bishvat. This was sort of the world's first Jewish Earth Day. And number four, Tishrei is the new year when Rosh Hashanah marks the anniversary of the creation of the world. But remember, even though it's a new year, I would say, are we party animals? And the answer is no. So, why are the new year and many other Jewish holidays two days long? It's not because we desire to stretch out the celebration. Rather, we're trying to ensure obedience to Scripture. The problem with the lunar calendar is that it becomes hard to be certain when the new moon was correctly identified. Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is the only holiday observed for two days in Israel and throughout the Diaspora. This is because it falls on Rosh Chodesh, the new moon. And it's just difficult to figure out if the day is actually the last day of Elul or the first day of Tishrei because a new moon is difficult to recognize at some times in some places. Now, Yom Kippur was limited to one day due to the hardship of fasting. And this brings me to a conversation about fake news, spoofed messages, and firewalls. You see, there are other more interesting reasons for extending some of our festivals. In temple days, you know, they did not have a farmer's almanac. There was no weather channel, no digital phones with dates and clocks set precisely by satellite for every time zone. The new moon was something someone saw in the sky and reported to headquarters in Jerusalem. They lit signal fires in different areas on the highest hilltops to pass on the information that the new moon had arrived. Certain festivals were marked based on the new moon. And since we couldn't be sure of the exact time to begin our festivals, to some, we added a day just to play it safe. And that became a very important decision. For example, with Passover being a seven-day celebration in Israel, to the millions of Jews living outside of the Holy Land, in the diaspora, as it is called, we can be confident that the correct seven days are enveloped in the traditional eight days of our modern celebration. But in ancient Israel, another perplexing reason created uncertainty about the timing of the new moon and the duration of Passover. As described in the New Testament, serious conflicts existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. That conflict continued into the times when the Jerusalem Talmud was compiled near the end of the fourth century, beginning of the fifth. The Samaritans were apparently a sneaky bunch at that time. They sabotaged the Jewish signal fires. 
they began lighting signal fires on the wrong day to confuse the non-Samaritan Jews, and it worked. The Jews who saw the false signal fires on top of the hilltops had no way of knowing it was a malicious attempt to deceive those celebrating God's Passover. They simply followed protocol and lit their own fires on the next hilltop to continue sending the news. However, the gullible firelight messengers were unintentionally sending a spoofed message. The rabbis soon realized this chaos was being communicated and they stopped using signal fires in the areas where the Samaritans lived. Well, the Samaritans may have created the first spoofed messages, but the Jews came up with the first firewall. The Babylonian Talmud wisely advised against limiting the celebration to seven days. Today, most Reformed Jews celebrate only seven days, but Passover is uniformly an eight-day celebration by most Jews around the world living outside of Israel. And for that extra day of forced matzah eating, I guess you can just thank the original Samaritan Fake News Bureau. There are a few other important questions that you may wish to answer at your leisure, so I will ask them for your consideration. What days are holy to you? How do you set them apart? Will your method of sanctifying them, I mean literally setting them apart, will your methods please you or God? And here's a question. Do you have a liturgy to help organize your reflections on the days you believe are holy. Think about it. Rosh Hashanah, an old liturgy to ring in a new year. I want to discuss three distinctions in the first festival of our High Holy Day liturgy. In modern practice, Three principal sections of the liturgy have been developed to make our lovely Rosh Hashanah services distinctive. Malchiut is kingship, Zichronot is remembrance, and Shofarot is the sounding of the ram's horn. The first of these important concepts, Malchiut, teaches Jewish worshipers about the majesty and oneness of our God, the king of the universe, the second, Zichronot, remembrance, it reminds us that God is our creator and our judge. And he is in covenant relationship with us. Shofarot gives us the blessed hope of our deliverer who will come to redeem us as promised. Hence, the Messiah is a very important aspect of our celebration. When we hear the sound of the shofar, a ram's horn, we think of the Shofar Hagadol, the great trumpet blast that will usher in the Messiah. To gain a mental visual, think about Gabriel blowing his horn when the saints go marching in. Jews and Christians believe in the resurrection from the dead and the coming of our Messiah. We believe in the final trumpet that will announce this event and shake us loose from the grave. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. You see, our belief in a resurrection from the dead has been the hope that has inspired faithful Jews and Christians for millennia. That belief strengthened the spiritual resolve of our martyrs who gave their lives rather than abandon their faith. One such account provides a poignant backdrop to our Rosh Hashanah liturgy. I want to tell you about the story of a favorite prayer in Rabbi Amnon of Mainz. This is the season to remember that God is our King. A famous Jewish prayer of this season is called the Unsana Tokef, written by Rabbi Amnon of Mainz, Germany. The legend behind the prayer is important and worth retelling. It's very ancient, dating back to the 10th century. This was a very dark time in Jewish history, filled with well-documented examples of Christian persecution of Jews 
during the Crusades. It is said that the Catholic Bishop of Mainz and Rabbi Amnon had a very fine working relationship. The rabbi had become a, a spokesman for the Jewish community. A measured friendship grew between the brilliant rabbi and the powerful bishop. Rabbi Amnon was well respected by the bishop because he was renowned to be a great Torah scholar. One time the bishop asked Rabbi Amnon if he'd consider converting to Christianity. And Rabbi Amnon was even offered a ministerial post in the court of the bishop. Of course, the position was conditioned on the rabbi's conversion. This question, although possibly said half jokingly, had no safe answer. To stall for time, Rabbi Amnon asked for three days in which to consider the bishop's offer of such a high and honored position. As soon as Rabbi Amnon returned home, he was distraught at the terrible mistake he had made. He was mortified that he even appeared to consider the bishop's proposal to convert. He knew it was an awful betrayal of God. He could not eat, he couldn't sleep for three days, and he prayed to God for forgiveness. How could he possibly let someone else think he would even contemplate leaving Judaism? And so he spent the three days in repentance, and when he didn't show up for his appointment, the bishop sent messengers to bring in Rabbi Amnon, but the rabbi refused to go. Finally, the bishop sent warrior monks to get Rabbi Amnon. The deadline for decision had passed, and the bishop demanded a response. The rabbi said, I should have my tongue cut out for not having refused immediately. The bishop angrily said that it was not his tongue that sinned, but his feet for not coming. He ordered them chopped off. Joint by joint, they hacked off Rabbi Amnon's toes, his feet, and his legs. Each time they asked him to convert, each time they promised to stop if he would comply, and the rabbi refused. Then they brutally cut off his arms. And when they were done, the bishop had Rabbi Amnon returned with his limbs in a wheelbarrow. Now, clearly, the rabbi's entire system was in shock. He was dying. On that night, prior to the first day of Rosh Hashanah, as the Kedusha was to be chanted, Rabbi Amnon asked that the ark be opened so that he could sanctify God's name in the synagogue one last time. His last wish was to publicly declare his faith in God's kingship, Malchiut. The king, HaMelech, with his dying breath, he uttered the words that have become our prayer of the Unsan at Tokyev. Having accomplished his mission, Rabbi Amnon abandoned his fight to stay alive, and he immediately died. So I ask you, what will it be, walls or bridges? What will we build? Anti-Semitic violence and evil betrayals have filled the tragic pages of Jewish history. Hatred and misunderstanding have cemented walls of division separating the Jews and Christians. We should knock them down and use the materials to construct bridges. It is not necessary to remain eternally bound to our biases. Rather, we can jettison such baggage and journey toward eternity much more peacefully if we pursue our similarities instead of our differences. Jews and Christians can be freed from viewing life as an either-or proposition. I propose we can interpret life as a both-and alternative, and most important, we can do so without compromise if we understand and reject the errors of our scarred history. A starting point might be to stop defining the categories of those who are outside of our own. 
I'm not convinced that anybody really knows the actual historical facts surrounding the event I just described, but for the sake of discussion, let's consider that a Catholic bishop attempted to force the conversion of a Jewish rabbi at the point of a sword. Those things definitely happened. The Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition and other similar events, those elements of church history suggest that such things were not exaggerated. And obviously, such behavior from a church leader would have been abhorrent and misguided. Nevertheless, if one were to base life and death decisions on their differences, there would be more death than life. But if it were their similarities that established the basis for relationship, there would be much, much more life shared before death. It would be true that a rabbi who was primarily committed to the beliefs of other rabbis would have many differences from a bishop who was primarily committed to the beliefs of other bishops. But if they were both primarily committed to the Old Testament, they'd have much in common. Perhaps relationships would grow instead of violent confrontations. Now, as will be shown, both Jews and Christians share a devoted belief in the coming of the Messiah, in the resurrection of the dead. And by the way, in roughly 76.4% of the Bible, those are three incredibly important starting points for building relationships instead of disdain, distrust, or disgust. If a common hope and some measure of common beliefs were shared openly, Jews and Christians would have a greater likelihood of honorable discourse instead of dishonorable disgrace. I, I will not diminish the importance of recognizing our differences as to the identity of the Messiah and the veracity of the New Testament. These do remain two points of distinction and disagreement and though I may be unable to resolve that for anyone other than myself, I can assure everyone, we don't need to kill each other over those unresolved matters. And speaking for Christians, I can say that if it happened as described by Jewish historians, the Bishop of Mainz made no friends among the Jews by shipping their rabbi home in little pieces. Yet, both Jews and Christians can learn much from his brilliant prayer. The poetic work attributed to Rabbi Amnon speaks of the sanctity of God's day of judgment. It declares, the great shofar is sounded, a still small voice is heard. This day even angels are alarmed, seized with fear and trembling as they declare the day of judgment is here. Then a mournful dirge is sung. Barosh Hashana Ika Sevun Ika Sevun Uvyom Tzom Kippur Yecha Semun Yecha the translation is, on Rosh Hashanah it is written, and on Yom Kippur it is sealed. Tradition declares that our judgment is being decided at this time. These are the days of awe, Yomim Noraim. During this time of penitence, observant Jews think about their sins and go to one another seeking forgiveness. Days of awe bring inner change. Yes, these are the days of awe, and this is why Jews fast and afflict their souls on Yom Kippur. We beat our breasts and cry out for forgiveness. There's a sense in which Jews understand the need to forgive one another if they are to find forgiveness. Certainly, this belief is one of many which the early church imported from the faith of our forefathers. And then there's the high point of our High Holy Days. My favorite moment during the High Holy Days is always on Rosh Hashanah during Shofarot. 
This is when the sounding of the ram's horn reminds us of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. We must know the true significance of the ram caught in a thicket. We recount God's call on Abraham to sacrifice his son, remembering that Isaac was the only beloved son of Abraham with his wife, Sarah. We're reminded of God's mercy and the supernatural provision of that ram. We dwell on God's plan for our lives and we recount the sacrificial provision God made for us. As I've previously mentioned, the shofar is the horn of a ram. It is a tool of the season to call us to teshuvah, repentance. Jewish people hear this sound on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The blast is to stir us, just as one wakes up in the morning to the familiar sound of our cell phone's alarm. When we hear the sound of the shofar, we should come to repentance. The correct usage of the instrument requires three basic notes plus one variation. Tekiah is one long blast. Shivarim is three short blasts. And Teruah is nine staccato blasts. Then a variation known as Tekiah Gedola is heard, climaxing in one extended long blast. When the shofar is heard, we are called to think. We are called to reflect on the condition of our souls. It is a clarion call to turn back to God. If, if you've never heard this unique call to repentance, you've missed a great blessing. You see, it is a mitzvah, a blessing. Literally, you're blessed to hear the ram's horn, the shofar sounded. Allow me to let you see and hear what it sounds like. Tekia. Shivarim. Teruah, Oh, you wouldn't know this unless I had told you, but from my youth, I was trained to be a Baal Tekia, one who sounds the shofar. It was a great privilege to be asked to do this for the youth of our synagogue as well as for the adult congregation while I was still welcome there among my people. In the many years since, I've been granted this privilege on many Christian platforms where Jews are loved and Israel is honored. So another question, why should one desire to hear the blast of the shofar? The answer is simple. It is a biblical mandate. Perhaps that is why it is also a blessing to the hearer. Rabbis have said that the mitzvah, the commandment, is not fulfilled by merely hearing the shofar as if by accident, but that the hearer must listen with the specific kavanah, the, the intention of fulfilling the biblical commandment. The biblical command to hear the shofar is expressed in Numbers chapter 29, verse 1. So here's another question. Why do some shofarot, that's the plural of shofar, look like elongated curled horns with several curled twists, and others simply look like the short J-shaped horn from a ram? Well, the answer is that there are actually several types of horns used in the making of a shofar. They typically come from five different species of clean, kosher animals. These are sheep, goats, mountain goats, antelope, and gazelle. Traditionally, a ram's horn is sounded because of its connection with the sacrifice of Isaac, as I mentioned, the Akedah, the story of which is the Torah reading for the second day of the Rosh Hashanah festival. The biblical portion, the text of the Akedah that I've mentioned, is surrounded by precious biblical truth and a beautiful rabbinic legend relevant to this discussion about the sounding of the shofar. The section of Torah studied in connection with the Akedah is found in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 19. The familiar story is of the ram caught in the thicket at the time of Isaac's submission to be sacrificed by his father Abraham. 
After Abraham's faith had been successfully tested by God, an alternative sacrificial victim was provided by God to be slaughtered in place of Abraham's son. Rabbinic lore tells the rest of the story left out of the Bible about the ram itself. The legend is of such mythical proportions that it's worth being recounted for your entertainment. The rabbis tell us this was no ordinary ram that Abraham sacrificed that day on Mount Moriah, for it had been created at twilight on the sixth day of creation for just this purpose, and every part of it was destined for a holy task. The skin became Elijah's garment, the sinews, the ten strings of David's harp, and the ashes, part of the altar in Jerusalem, but most special of all were the two horns. One was destined to sound at Sinai when God revealed the Ten Commandments, and the other will announce the end of days. The rabbis stretched the myth in directions I find awkward, but interesting. For example, they attribute much of the incident to Satan. In fact, they suggest the ram was actually running toward the altar to present itself as a sacrifice when Satan entrapped it at a thorn bush. Now, the Bible declares no such involvement. More problematic, when the sacrifice was safely concluded, the rabbis proposed that Satan went to find Sarah to tell her that Abraham had actually killed Isaac. Then they have Satan reversing his story to Sarah's joy, only to have Sarah drop dead and get buried next to Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve became so embarrassed by their own sins as compared to Sarah's good deeds that they asked to leave the cave. Personally, I wish the rabbis would have simply left the legend alone with the ram's horn announcing the coming of the Messiah at the end of days, but that would require a rabbinic script rewrite that is not likely to happen and might end on the horns of a dilemma. Oh, dad joke. Oh, is there a special Hebrew blessing for bad puns and dad jokes? Can it even be forgiven? Hmm. Well, I don't know if that dad joke was worth appreciating or not, but regardless, we're out of time. In the next episode, we're going to pick up right where we left off, so make sure to look out for that. Until next time, shalom and God bless.